billions and billions served. For many years, that was the McDonald's slogan, indicating that across the world, billions of happy customers had been served well by the restaurant. That's what I think of when I read Psalm 3, because it has common human experiences in it. Betrayal, flood of life, potential murder, dishonor, discouragement, slander, justice, vindication. Billions upon billions of saints across the centuries have read this psalm and have said, that's me, that's where I'm at. That's how I feel in this unfair divorce. That's how I feel with this prodigal child. This is how I feel in my workplace. God, I've been faithfully serving you and there's threats against me. And so I invite you today to make this story your own. The Psalms are written so that we would know common human situations and how the godly should respond because of the way the godly did respond. Psalm 3, struck by the sword, but saved by grace. The story begins, Psalm 3, with great intensity, verses 1 and 2. Human evil in the trouble with the sons. David's having trouble with his family, and Absalom, his son, is out for his life. We know that because of this helpful title here. You read the title of the psalm here, a psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now, not all the psalms, we've said, are written by David, and not all of them have titles. But when they have a title, I encourage you to pause and either remember the story that's being referenced or go and look it up. In this case, you would find the story across many chapters in 2 Samuel. This is Absalom's revolt. He's making a play for the throne. He'll kill David if he can get his hands on him. He's quietly gathered his supporters. It's a conspiracy. We saw in Psalm 2 that people conspire against the Lord's anointed. They, they plan freedom. They plan to rule. That's what's happened here. Over many years, Absalom has laid the foundation, and now he's making a play for the throne. David has wisely fled with his fathers from Jerusalem, and soon Absalom will be pursuing him to the point of death. How tragic. Absalom was very blessed. The Bible says he was very handsome, and he had the ancient equivalent of great hair. Very long, but he was proud and cunning. That's the human evil. From a human perspective, you can explain this. This is a young man who's gotten too big in his ego, and he thinks that instead of waiting for his father to die, he should kill his father and take the throne. That's human evil. But if we only looked at the psalm that way, we would be the mistake, making the mistake that many people do. They suffer, and they don't ask the question, what is God doing? Because, see, there's a divine discipline occurring here. If you know the story in 2 Samuel, you understand that God has predicted this would happen. In fact, God has brought this about. This is where I like to say we need bifocals. We need to be able to look down at things close to us, the human motives, the human things happening, and look up at the divine perspective. The bifocals are needed here. Because as surely as we have human evil and Absalom out for murder, we have divine discipline. David is living with the scars of sin. We see this in 2 Samuel, the story involved in verses 15 through 18. Now David's fall, his great sin is well known. Even non-Christians know it. The David king who had everything has adultery with Bathsheba, has her husband killed. Adultery, murder, treason. Hypocrisy. And God responds to that. And, and again, many people know that story and then they know the amazing story of God's grace, right? Was David pardoned? Yes. Amen. Wonderful. David's confronted and he repents. That's the happy side of the story. And, and I want to affirm that. We have an entire psalm coming up where David rejoices. How blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, and whose sins have been covered. How blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not count against him. David is saved by grace. But God will unleash a sword against him. God can forgive us our sins and leave the consequences and the scars. The murderer in prison who becomes a Christian isn't freed from his murder sentence, is he? No, it doesn't work that way. We can still be paying for our sins on a human level even though we're forgiven. Did God predict that David would suffer? Yes. Listen to the words of the prophet. In the same passage where David has promised he would not die, he's forgiven. 
Here's the words of the Lord against David. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have dishonored me and have taken the wife of Uriah Hittite to be your wife, thus says the Lord, I, hear that, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. Pretty hard words, right? Who will raise up evil against David? God says he will. I, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. This has been, David's been pardoned, but God has predicted that David will suffer for his sin. And did God perform this? Oh yes, terrible family trauma. One son rapes a daughter of David. The trauma is there. That son is killed by Absalom, an act of vigilante justice. So we have a dead son, an assaulted daughter, Absalom is driven into exile, and in grace, David brings them back and restores them. And now, instead of there being peace in David's house, Absalom, instead of enjoying his forgiveness and his restoration to his father, Absalom has been plotting against the throne. And now David and his followers are fleeing. You know, as I read 2 Samuel, I realize this is four chapters long in the story. We're to pause and to think about the fact that although God pardons and he doesn't hold our sin against us, often he disciplines us. You know, God disciplines and trains his believers even if it's not sin. You may not have done something bad. God may not be chastising you, but God often uses suffering and evil to strengthen us. And so the Psalms are going to say this many times. I'm not going to linger here, but I want us to realize as Christians that when we suffer, we are rightly to turn to God and say, God, you've got a plan. God, you've got a purpose. I need grace. I need mercy. Notice that even though David deserves this, he's praying. He's praying for grace and mercy. And so we say, Lord, I don't quite understand what's happening or I understand quite well what's happening. I'm suffering for my sin. But now, Lord, you're in charge and I'm asking for grace and mercy. Just because God is disciplining us and strengthening us doesn't mean he doesn't love us and we can ask for grace. That's what David says. There are two big questions here. Verses 1 and 2 ask two big questions. The first one is, will David lose his life? That's what David's praying about. Verse 1, O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. David says, Lord, as the hours pass, more and more people join his side. I'm fleeing Jerusalem, and Absalom is in Jerusalem consolidating his support. And more and more people are turning against me. My enemies increased by the hour. Lord, am I going to die? So one question is, will David lose his life? Verse 1. And the second question is, has David lost God's love? Okay, because I said that happens, right? Sometimes when we suffer, we ask the question, does God still love us? And the answer to the Bible is yes. But you know what? Other people ask that question too. It's as old as Job. That when we suffer, people begin to assume and presume the wrong thing. Verse 2, many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance from in God. Kicking the downcast, kicking lowly is ancient, isn't it? David was once in power, and now that he flees, people are cackling at him. People are cursing him and saying things like, God doesn't love you anymore. You're getting what you deserve, you scoundrel. Or saying that he's abandoned by God. If cursing the king is a bad motive, saying he's been abandoned by God is bad theology. Again, this is very old. We have this weird view as human beings that if we suffer, God is angry with us, and if we're blessed, God is happy with us. Absalom is feeling quite good in Jerusalem. Surely God has blessed him. He's king after all. He succeeded. And here's David fleeing and hurting and weeping, and people are deciding that David doesn't get God's love anymore. If you want to see a New Testament example of that, turn to John 9, where the disciples see a man born blind, and they say to Jesus the classic question of the Jews, did this man sin in the womb, or did his parents sin? Because surely sin occurred because of blindness. And Jesus shows that's not the case. So the big question, will David lose his life? Because he has many adversaries, verse 1. And, number 2, has David lost God's love? Many are saying in my soul, there is no deliverance from God. Before we get to the answer to those questions, I want to make three prayer applications because this whole psalm drives us to prayer. 
Very helpful that in January, often at churches, we have a prayer emphasis. So here it is from the psalm, how we pray. Number one, in prayer, speak to God instead of being silent. In prayer, speak to God instead of being silent. Now, some of you are blessed with being tough. And some of you are blessed with a stiff upper lip. And because of your personality or your family, almost nothing levels you. And when you're suffering, you go silent. You say, well, I just got to bear this. I just got to put up with it. I just have to endure. I just have to be tough. And let me say to you that tough just doesn't work with God. You don't have to go blab and complaining all your problems to other people, but you need to speak to God about them. Silence in your suffering is deadly. You know, we know that medically and emotionally. We know that anger and frustration that are kept in not expressed lead to depression. Now, notice David doesn't speak to other people. So it is true that you and I shouldn't be telling everybody all of our problems and lamenting and grumbling and moaning and complaining. Okay, that's a different problem. But notice that David freely speaks to God everything that's in his heart. So in prayer, speak to God instead of being silent. And I, I fear in our rural context here in Southern Illinois that the people are tough here. That They don't often express their pain. They, they bear it and endure it. And the question is, do you take it to God? Because David is quick to say, excuse me, God, I'm suffering. And you and I need to do that. And if you would go to God more with your suffering, you'd pray more. Find me a Christian who's not praying much, and I'll find you a Christian who's not handling the suffering very well. So number one, in prayer, speak to God instead of being silent. And number two, speak to God in prayer instead of threatening enemies or striking them. You see, David takes his anger, David takes his pain, he takes it to the Lord, and he hands it off. He doesn't hold it within, but he takes it away. Instead of getting angry with Absalom, Instead of getting angry with his enemies and threatening them, as he surely could, he still has an army, or striking at them, David prays. You see, you and I are the peacemakers, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You and I are to seek peace at all price. We're to pray for our enemies and love those who persecute us. Well, how do we do that? Well, first we take our pain to God in prayer, and we leave it with him. And so in prayer, we speak to God instead of threatening enemies or striking them in vengeance. And David shows us both. Because from the story in 2 Samuel, we know that David deals in grace. Even though he has to send his army after Absalom. Even though David knows he's the king and justice requires that he retake the throne. As he sends his armies out into battle against the armies of Absalom, he says this. Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom, which the armies interpret as, don't kill him. So, so David knows what needs to happen. He needs to win. This needs to happen. David needs to be spared. He knows the righteous side. David's not doubting himself. But David says, as you do this battle, protect my son. You see, David's dealt with his anger towards God. He's expressed to his God his sorrow. And he's willing to forgive Absalom a second time. He's forgiven him for killing his son. He's going to forgive him for trying to kill him. If Absalom survives his battle, David would have surely taken care of him every day of his life. And even harder, I think, you know, we can say, well, that's the father's love for a son, is that as David's fleeing Jerusalem, we actually have a scoundrel who's cursing him. So again, that skeptic, that person who says when you're suffering, well, you deserve it. You're getting what comes to you. There's a figure here, Shimei. And as David and his armies leave Jerusalem, he's cursing David. He's cursing the anointed of the Lord. This is a horrible sin towards God, but it's a horrible personal offense. Here's what he shouts after David. Get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow. So bad is the cursing and taunting that David's soldier says to him, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over now and cut off his head. <laughs> okay, I mean, I understand that David's soldier is a little out of line here, but, but you understand this. King, this fool is cursing you. The Lord's anointed. I'll take his head for you. And how easy it would have been David to say, yes, yes, this is evil against me. Go bring vengeance upon his head. But David won't. 
David won't let his armies hurt Absalom, and he won't hurt, let his soldiers hurt this cursing man because David is taking his prayer and his pain and his petitions to God. In prayer, speak to God instead of being silent. In prayer, speak to God instead of threatening your enemies or striking them. And number three, in prayer, apply the gospel backward and forward. So when you and I are hurting, when, when we've been betrayed, when bad things happen, we look back and we say, just as Jesus, so I will. Because don't you see Jesus here? Jesus comes a little bit later in history, but he's the perfect son. Whereas David's messed up with adultery and murder, Jesus is the perfect son. He is the only human being who needed no discipline. And yet, he was struck for us. He was punished for our iniquities. The punishment for us all was laid upon him. It was the Father's good pleasure to punish the Son as if he had done wrong because we had. David's suffering for his sins, Jesus suffers for our sins. He's the greater and perfect Son. And from the cross, just like David, Jesus won't threaten those who are mocking him. He is silent in the face of ridicule and he even speaks of forgiveness. He offers forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Even in his dying breath, he's reaching out to the thief on the cross. You see, what David does imperfectly, Jesus does perfectly and sets a model for us. So when we're betrayed, when we're suffering, we look back to Jesus and say, Oh, Jesus, give me the strength by the Holy Spirit to live in this situation with grace and love and mercy and forgiveness, just as you did. You know, that's his tormentors he won't threaten, but he won't even respond to those who are mocking him. You know, this very theology that to suffer, especially suffer on the cross, means God doesn't love you is what they say to him. The religious leaders at the foot of the cross say, he trusts in God, let him rescue him now, if he delights in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Their argument is, Jesus, if your father really loved you, you wouldn't be there. You ran around our whole country talking about God like he was your father and God like he loved you, but look where you're at. You see, sometimes people are going to use bad theology against us. They're confused. They've conflated suffering with God's wrath. And one last parallel between David and Jesus. Remember that David's soldier wanted to draw the sword. And Jesus' soldier, Peter, did too. And Peter actually cuts off a slave's ear. And Jesus forbids it. So what are you and I supposed to do? Well, we're not supposed to seek vengeance, are we? We're to take it to God in prayer. That's the trouble with the sons. Then I see verses 3 through 4, the turning point of the story. I see that two ways that we get a turning point. Because what's going to happen is David's going to stop looking at his enemies and praying to God. And he's going to start looking to God and praying to God. So, so David's still praying, but after in prayer, you and I think about we're enemies and who are against us and the threats and the cancer and the disease and whatever is arrayed against us. After we think about that in prayer before God, then we think about God himself. The turning point is when we turn our eyes upon God. I love that old hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full at his glorious face. And the things of earth will look strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We, we turn from our problems in prayer to God in our prayer. And I see this marked out two ways. We have this word here in the psalm, Selah, that's written for us. Now, I have to be honest with you, we struggle to know what that means. Um, there's no consensus. It at least means a pause. It means a break in the psalm. So as the psalm is being read, it's a pause. It could mean, when you read the psalms, pause and meditate. It could be a musical instruction for the musicians to do something. It marks it off. And so there's a turning point marked off in the psalm after we read in verse 2, many are saying in my soul, there is no deliverance from God. Pause. Because the story is changing. There's an intermission here. That's a turning point. And then you see verse 3, but. I love that. But. That means it's going to change. So David says, it's really bad, Lord. But. Notice what he says. But you, O oh Lord. Listen, your prayers of lament, your prayers of sorrow will change when you say, but you, Lord. You see, you and I are taking our eyes off our problem. It's okay to start with our problem. That, that's right. And then we turn our eyes to Jesus. We look at the Father and we say, but you. And it 
begins to change. Two marks there, the Selah and the But You, O Lord. What we're getting is what David's thinking and feeling his heart. This is an insight into his private heart meditations. And again, this is helpful for us because we have been betrayed, probably. We probably will be betrayed before we reach heaven, right? Our, our people are saying things against us wrongly, and we turn to this. The turning point of the soul is looking to God, verses 3 through 4. You know, God knew that David needed this, and so God had already taught David a lot. David had already received mercy. The prophet had told him he won't die. David's probably thinking, you know, God didn't kill me for adultery. He probably won't kill me now. David knows he's been promised the eternal kingdom, and so David begins to reflect upon God's promises. And he is close with God. I don't want this to slip by you when he says, but you, O oh Lord... He's using the word for Yahweh. This is intimate. Every time he says Lord in the psalm, he's speaking in an intimate way. For us, it would be when we pray and our say, our Father, or, or my Father. It's a term of intimacy and closeness. Abba, Father. So every time David says, but you, O oh Lord, he's speaking in familiar, intimate language. And then I see that David, as he thinks about this, there's four foundations for his hope. The way David moves from despair to determination, the way David makes it is because as he reflects upon God, he sees four things that will speak to us today. Number one, God shielding. God shielding, we see the word shield in verse three. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. A shield about me. Now, I suspect as modern believers, we don't think of God much as a shield. Uh, many Christians, God is my shepherd, yes. God is my father, yes, hallelujah. We have all these great images. But David, in need of protection, there are actually going to be physical swords coming against him. He needs a shield. And so when you read the Bible that God's a shield, it means God protects our life. This is the exact same thing told Abraham. In Genesis 15, 1, God says to him, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. And 18 times in the Psalms, we're going to read the same thing, that God is a shield. And so in doing this, I want to remind you that you and I should add this to our language of prayer. That when we're discouraged, when we're frustrated, when we have enemies or our disease is coming for us, we say, Lord, you are my shield. How comforting is that? It's good and right that we say God is with me. Right? That's good, right? God is with me. He will go with me through the valley. God will go with me through the disease. But this is saying, God, you're in front of me. You're like an ancient shield. Maybe I can say it this way. It must come through you to get to me. It must come through you to get to me. How different you and I would live if we said, this cancer must come through you to get to me. This enemy must come through you to get to me. This bankruptcy, whatever it is, this heartbreak, it must come through you, Lord. It must pass through your shield to get to me. You'll protect me, or you'll permit it, but you are a shield about me. God's shielding is one foundation for hope. The second one is God's glory. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. This verse 3, my glory. When he says my glory, he's reflecting upon who God is in his nature, He's saying, God, you rule. God, you are more powerful than an enemy. God's glory is the sum of who he is. God, you are all knowing. You are all powerful. You are all loving. You know what he's saying? He's saying, not my glory, Lord. Not Absalom's glory. Here we have two men competing for the throne. Not my strength, Lord. Not the strength of my enemy. But you, you have the glory. You are not only my shield, you are my glory. You can do anything you want, Lord. I have no reason to be fearful. I think the New Testament equivalent is Paul in Romans 8, 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Again, believer, I encourage you to come back to this psalm many times. I encourage you to memorize it. Because there are going to be times that you're going to say, it seems like everything's arrayed against me. And you need to go back to this psalm or, or Romans 8 or one of the many passages of the Bible and say, no, if God is for me, who can be against me? He is getting God's shielding. He's getting God's glory. And then God the exalter. This is my favorite phrase here. But you, O Lord, are shielded about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. 
Well, this image is really easy. Why do you hang your head down? It's because you're discouraged, right? Or fearful. Here David says, you take the lowly and you lift them up. And although David doesn't say it, David also knows that God takes the high and mighty and pompous and he brings them low. David says, you specialize in exalting the lowly. It's an expression of confidence. David's head is actually hung low in despair and defeat. Here's a description of how David and his army leave Jerusalem. And David went up the ascent to the Mount of Olives and wept as he went. And his head was covered and he walked barefoot. Then all the people who were with him each covered his head and went up weeping as they went. Defeated, discouraged, fearful, lowly. You might use the word pathetic. How is this weeping, barefoot army, how are they going to defeat Absalom, right? They're grieving. But you know they're just being honest. To be low when we suffer is normal. And I notice that David intentionally lowers himself. You see, you and I are not low by circumstances, right? And some people come along and say, be brave, be strong, lift up your head, be tough. But here's what David does. David says, I'm low and I'll lower myself even more because the more I lower myself, the more I humble myself, the more you'll lift me up. You can see that in that passage. I didn't read this whole thing to you, but after Simeon has cursed him, and David won't let his soul take vengeance. David says, let him alone and let him curse. The Lord has told him. Hear these words. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me. David says, no, it's okay. I'll put up with my son trying to kill me. I'll put up with this fool cursing me. I've been driven from my home. My life is on the line. But it's okay. Let it happen. Oh, Lord, let it be. David is letting the circumstances humble himself and his people. And David says, now that I'm lowly, Lord, you're the one who lifts the lowly. Hear me. God's heart is drawn in mercy towards the broken lowly. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, who's known as David, said this in her song of praise. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. Ashy, to make them set with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. That's like Mary, the mother of Jesus, prays in her praise. God lifts the lowly. And so the, the mark for you and I, the lesson for you is that when we suffer, when bad things happen to us, we get low before God. We, we cry out to him in prayer. We tell him our problem. We look to him and we say, God, you are the great reverser. You are the one who rescues. You are the one who lifts my head. And then the fourth thing is that God answers prayers. Verse 4, I was crying the Lord with my voice, and he answered from his holy mountain. I was crying the Lord with my voice, and he answered from his holy mountain. David is sure, David is absolutely certain that God has heard him and will respond. Dear, beloved child of God, God will always hear you, and he will always answer you in a way to reach the best goals for you in his glory. God always hears you and he will always answer. Now you may not understand the answer. You may not get it till heaven, but God will always reach the best goal for your life. Whatever God's purpose is in your life, God will reach it and he will do it in a way that will eventually bring you joy and glory. He will answer according to wisdom. Oh, how thankful I am that God doesn't answer my prayers exactly the way I pray them but he answers them the right way. I can't make a wreck of my life when I pray. I can say anything to God, and God fixes my prayers by the power of the Holy Spirit within me who prays, and God will answer according to his wisdom. God will answer anytime, anywhere, in any condition, activity, or posture. David's praying as he goes, right? He's praying as he ascends from Jerusalem. He's praying as he lays his head low. You and I can pray anywhere. You know, the Jews believed God was present in the tabernacle and the ark in Jerusalem, and, and there was a sense in which God manifested his presence there. But notice that although David's not in the holy city, in the holy tabernacle, he knows that God can hear him. He's overturning kind of a, an idea that people had that you had to be in the holy city, the holy place. It'd be like somebody says, well, I got to get to church and pray because God hears me in the church building. 
Well, it's true that God's delighted when you pray in church, but God's with you wherever you're at. And so David knows, I have prayed, God's answered it. Again, God's got this. Two more prayer applications flow from this. Number one, in prayer, lean on God's character you have learned. Now here's the challenge. Do you know God's character? You see, this is the advantage of Bible study and Sunday school and good preaching and, and you're reading the word. If you don't know who God is, you will not have comfort in your affliction. The better you know God, the better you can call upon Him. If you can say, God, I know from the Bible you have all power. You have all knowledge. You have all love. You're everywhere. You're eternal. You're immutable. You are just. You are holy. You are good. If you can say to God who he is, you can pray. In prayer, lean on God's character you have learned and, and make it a commitment that you're going to learn God's character. Number two, trust that God does hear you and will act in his best interest and yours. They're always the same. God never says, well, my plan would be this, but that's not the best plan for you, so I'll do my plan. Or, this is the best plan for you, but not the best plan for me, I'll do your plan. God never does that. They're always the same. God's best interests are yours. And so as surely as we lean upon God's character, and that includes his goodness and his wisdom, we know that God's heard us and he will answer. We saw trouble with the sons in verses 1 through 2. David's distress. Then we saw the turning point as his soul looks to God in verses 3 through 4. And then in 5 through 8, we see trust in the Savior. Verse 5, David says the most remarkable thing. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. You slept, David? When they're out for your head? I lay down and slept. He actually sleeps. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of the people who have set themselves against me round about. Now you have to ask, is this the same person that, that prayed that his son was out to kill him? Has he had this, some sort of psychotic break? I mean, has David lost his mind? No. David has anchored his faith in his God. And he says, hey, God's in control. I have no reason to worry. May I say to you lovingly and carefully that the physical proof of your faith is often sleep. The physical proof of your faith is often sleep. Can you sleep at night? Can, can you rest? Now, now let me put a, a provision in here. We're talking spiritually. There may be some medical reasons why you can't sleep. Okay, if you drink a lot of caffeine at night. Uh, if you can't sleep, go see a doctor, right? There may be some medical things keeping you away. I understand that. I, I'm not knocking that. But I'm saying that when you're laying in the bed at night, whether you can sleep or not, you should be at peace. The idea is here is that David's not panicked. So you say, Pastor, I can't sleep much at night. Well, good. <laughs> Ponder God's word. The Psalms talk about meditating on God's word. Get the Bible out and read it. God's giving you extra time. Pray. Ponder. Praise. If you're awake in the middle of the night, it's to praise the Lord. Spend time with Him. But you should be able to sleep, or at least emotional peace. And when you can't, when you're all stirred up, please know that's a lack of faith. It's anxiety, it's a sin. And so you need to run back to God. David says, I'm so relaxed now that even though I don't know if Absalom will kill me tomorrow, I'm just going to go to sleep. Wow. Our, our world looks for peace and, and safety, doesn't it? Our world looks for a way to, to know, to know what's going to happen. But that's not the way we live as Christians. We don't know what happens, but we know the one who does. Threats don't threaten sleep. We get examples of this. Jesus asleep in the boat during the storm. Remember that? His disciples panic. The way it's described, described as the waves are actually coming over that little boat. And by all human means looking below, they're dead. And they wake Jesus. Save us. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Jesus is so sure the Father has a plan for his life. He's so sure the Father loves him. He's sleeping in the storm. And then I'm sure one of the people who woke him up and was upset was Peter. And Peter goes on, and as he matures as a Christian, he reaches the point in Acts chapter 12, where he's in prison. And the plan is the next morning, Herod's going to bring him out and kill him. He's already killed James. The only reason why he hasn't killed Peter is because of a Jewish festival. And in the morning, Peter's dead. And when the angel of the Lord comes to rescue Peter in Acts chapter 12, he has to hit him in the side because Peter is asleep. 
Peter's made peace with God. Peter's been walking in peace. Peter's probably prayed. He's probably prayed the Psalms, and now he's asleep. Again, please look at your physical life. Please look at your anxiety level and know that you and I should be trusting in Jesus, trusting the Savior. Our level of trust is our level of tranquility. Peace, God speaks over our lives. God saves, verse 8, so sleep and don't fear anything. Verse 8 says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Let me step back for a minute here before we do the last couple verses and say this. We're in our psalm series called The Shepherd and His Sheep. And one of my goals has been to show you the gospel in every psalm. The gospel is there. In Psalm 1, to be known by the shepherd is to be saved. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. We said that being known by God is being saved. In Psalm 2, we learn that we take refuge in the shepherd and we're blessed. If we don't take refuge in our own ability, if we come to the Lord, no matter what they're plotting against us, like David, we'll be blessed. The gospel's there, isn't it? Come, be sheltered by Jesus and be blessed. And then in Psalm 3, the shepherd alone saves from danger. Not by my, but by power, or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so the gospel flows in these psalms. We just have to look for it. I see the gospel in all three psalms we cover. And then let's wrap up here with God's agenda, verses 7 through 8. Remember, David isn't praying for vengeance, but he does want vindication. Well, God will bring both. You see, David doesn't want Absalom killed, but God does. So as you and I pray and we say, Lord, I know this person doesn't like me, but forgive them and grace and peace. God will bring vengeance. Here's verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Inspired by the Spirit of God, David prays wrath. You hear that? David's willing to forgive his son. David's willing to not curse. But when it comes to God's justice and his righteousness, he gets angry. He gets stirred up. Arise, O Lord, save me. You have spitten all my enemies on the cheek. You see, personal peace would be important for David, but something more is necessary. More than personal peace is at stake. Absalom has lifted his hand against the Lord's anointed. Absalom is going to die. In a great irony, his, his beautiful hair gets him caught in a tree as he's fleeing, and he hangs there, disgraced and helpless, and he's slain. And to be hung by a tree of any form, just like Jesus was, is to be under a curse. You see, God sometimes acts against our enemies in this lifetime because justice is at stake, the gospel is at stake. Sometimes God intervenes when Christians are persecuted. Sometimes God intervenes in families, and he brings justice and Honestly, we say, wow, you know, Lord, I, I wouldn't have wanted that. But see, God's justice will be done. The triumph of truth. God will bring justice. You and I don't need to worry about that. He will. David must be restored to the throne. Remember who God picked. God picked David. Who must be king? David. The Lord's anointed must defeat the schemers. You see, this is more than just David personally. This is David and God's plan. It is God's plan for David to be king. And David will be king, and God will strike down the enemy. Something even David won't pray for. And Absalom's not supposed to be king. Who's supposed to be king? Solomon. And David and Solomon form the line of the ancestors of Jesus. Jesus does not come from the lineage of Absalom. Jesus comes from the lineage of David and Solomon. And so our salvation is at stake here. If Absalom wins, if David's dead, if Solomon doesn't take the throne, there's no saving salvation, there's no gospel. So please know that when we cry for vindication, God will bring his own vengeance. They are linked. In closing, some shielding applications. Again, I want you to think about God as a shield. And then when we pray, we're invoking the shield of God. Number one, the best prayer is asking God to do as he promised. The best prayers are when we say, God, you said it, please do it. God, you said you would protect me. Please protect me. God, you said you would judge the wicked. Now judge the wicked. 
God, you said you would give me sleep. Give me sleep. We say to God, God, I've heard what you said. I love what you said. I'm stooping low here and I'm begging you. Do what you said. That's the best prayer. Number two, prayer can be a battle cry. Prayer can be a battle cry. It is right that we often teach children to fold your hands, bow your heads, and speak in a slow, reverent, deep voice. But prayer can be lamentation. Prayer can be tears and crying. I read it again this morning, Hebrews 5, 8, that Jesus in the days of flesh cried out with loud tears and crying to his Father. You can be loud. You can be vocal. You can be out loud. You, you can weep before the Lord. That prayer, it can be an angry battle cry. Lord, justice. Lord, bring truth. It does not have to be meek and mild. Most of your prayer should be, but you can pray like David. Number three, prayer is admitting that salvation belongs to the Lord. The reason why prayer is hard for you and I is when we pray, we say, I can't, but you can't. Why would you pray about something that you can pull off in your own strength? And sometimes Christians do that. They don't pray much because they're convinced they can do it. But prayer is, you think the folded hands means not working, right? I'm not, I'm not working, I'm not fighting, I'm not going to pull it off. Folded hands, hands still. Lord, your salvation belongs to you. I, I need that. Praying is admitting that salvation belongs to the Lord. And if we know salvation belongs to the Lord, he will bless us. That's what this says. Salvation belongs to the Lord. You're a blessing be upon your people. May you and I live in that blessing. Number four, look to the gospel to save us from spiritual danger. God will always rescue us from spiritual danger. The gospel guarantees it. We will always win spiritually. Saint of God, beloved child, adopted by a father, you will always win spiritually. Count on it. Number five, look to God's goodness to save us from other peril. Now, we will always win spiritually. We may not always win physically. We don't have a guarantee that God will spare us hardships. But when we go through them, we look to God's goodness. We say, you are a shield. You are glorious. You lift my head, you answer my prayers. We lean on his goodness. We lean on the gospel for spiritual protection. We lean on his goodness to give us confidence he often saves us from peril. And number six, let us worship God as our mighty shield. Whatever it is that you are facing, whatever it is your family member is facing, whatever it is your church member friend is facing, let us today bring them before the throne of God and trust him as the mighty shield 